Today we're going to talk about uh, G. Field Foster and the Glen Canyon Project. Some of you are probably familiar at least with the second topic. If you've been through the exhibit, it's on uh, MA archaeologists' work at Glen Canyon. So I'm going to do an introduction about the Glen Canyon Project and then I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who is the expert on uh, Gene Foster. Before the construction of the Glen Canyon Dam and filling of Lake Powell, um, scientists from MNA and the University of Utah explored the Colorado River main stem and its tributaries to document the natural and cultural um, resources that would be lost by, through inundation by Lake Powell. The project was formally known as the Upper Colorado River Basin Archaeological Salvage Project, but it's more colloquially known as um, the Glen Canyon Project. So the Glen Canyon Dam was authorized uh, by the U.S. Congress in 1956, and the Glen Canyon Project was funded by the Bureau of Reclamation between 1957 and 1963. The project documented more than 2,000 archaeological sites and um, excavated about 100 of them. By today's standards, the work was not top-notch, but for the time, it was really amazing. It was really cutting edge. The archaeologists did, um, they did things like record historic sites related to mining and ranching, like the cabin in the lower, lower left. And that was something that most archaeologists weren't really doing at the time. We are now, but at the time, those people were really focused on prehistory. So that was something um, innovative. They were very good about documenting rock art. Um, and so all of these things um, were slightly, as I say, ahead of their time. And it has left us with a really good basis on which to continue archaeological research in the area. The Glen Canyon Project was co collaboratively worked on between the Museum of Northern Arizona and the University of Utah. University of Utah was responsible for the Colorado River Canyon and its tributaries between Height Crossing down to the, the junction with uh, the San Juan River, and then the right-hand side from there down to Leesville, the right-hand side tributaries. The museum uh, concentrated on the, the San Juan River from about Clay Hills Crossing all the way down to the confluence and then the left-hand tributaries down to Lee's Ferry. Both institutions also worked in the highlands. MNA worked around Navajo Mountain and Cummings Mesa, and the University of Utah worked along the Kipirowitz Plateau. And the idea here was to look at the archaeological resources in the uplands and compare them with those in the lowlands down along the canyons to see if we were looking at the same culture groups, different, how people were using those disparate um, landforms and environments through time. So m &A was really a very, very logical choice for doing, for being part of the Glen Canyon project because their archaeology staff um, was, had already been working all over the Colorado, Southern Colorado Plateau and had actually been working in the canyons um, of the Colorado and the tributaries since the early 1950s when word came out that there was going to be a dam built and these canyons would be inundated. Um, in fact, uh, Gene Foster had been doing river trips since 1952 uh, when, when these rumors surfaced. And so she had already amassed quite a collection of uh, records on the archaeological sites in the canyon. And in 1957, when the, the project was formally launched, then she turned all of those records over to m and who continued the work. And I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Hello everyone. As Kim mentioned, Jean Field Foster had been working on the river on her own since about 1952. She was an artist. She took uh, incredible photos like this one at her uh, during her time on Glen Canyon. Her first trip was in the spring of 1952, and that fall she wrote in the m and Plateau this quote, My role in this is in the early 90s I was working as a photo archivist at m and and I came across this collection of 500 color images of Glen Canyon. 
I knew of Lake Powell. I didn't know anything about Glen Canyon, but I knew that those photos were incredibly valuable. They were deteriorating because they were shot on a film that was unstable. We had 500 photos and we had a donor for about 125 photos to, to color correct what was happening. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. That story, at the same time, I was talking with Catherine Bartlett, some of you remember her, about MA history. And then as I read through her documents, um, in interviews she had done, I came to see a story between Catherine, Jean, and Glen Canyon. And that's how all of this has come about. So Jean, born in Wisconsin, her maternal grandfather was Eugene Fields. And she attended the School of Art. During World War II, she worked in a Connecticut munitions plant, caught pneumonia, and was advised to move west to regain her health. She moved to Prescott, bought a lot in, 19, in 1946, and built a home. And a few years later, she moved over to Sedona and opened a carpentry shop. And then she met the Coltons, Dr. and Mrs. Colton, and Catherine Bartlett. And I'll talk a little bit more about Catherine. But that meeting started Jean on what became her life's work. She was an excellent carpenter, things her dad had taught her. She became a wonderful river runner, and this is key, the portraits of the Flagstaff people. You can see Jean's self-portrait on the screen. We also have the original. Probably about a month ago, the, a nephew of Jean's in Wisconsin contacted m and and said, we have this self-portrait. Somehow he knew of m and connection with Jean, and now he, he donated this wonderful self-portrait to m and Collections. Those things just make me, give me chills. <laughs> so exciting. But when Jean moved to Flagstaff in the early 50s, there was an art patron, Viola Babbitt, in town who supported local artists by providing opportunities to do their art, in Jean's case, painting. So you might have a portrait somewhere in your, if you had people in Flagstaff in the 50s, there might be a portrait that Jean did of your people, or you know of one. So if, if you know of something, and you can see her signature in the bottom right hand corner when you look at the original. Um, if you know of something, let, let Tony M&A know, because we would like to at least get a photo of it if nothing else. And just before we started, a woman walked in and showed Tony a, pic a, a pencil drawing that Jean had done in 1948 of this woman's mother. And the woman is gonna donate the, pic the drawing to m and as part of the Jean Foster collection. More chills. <laughs> Another thing she did, she was known as the bird lady in town. Um, and she hired high school students to record all of the information on the pinion jays that she um, nested in her backyard. And all that data is in the Jean Foster collection as well. This is a photo of Jean on the left and Catherine Bartlett on the right, charming holiday photo in their home in Flagstaff. Jean and Catherine became partners and for a while there, Catherine was driving to and from Sedona every day to, to live in Sedona and come to work at m &A. But after a while, they decided to move to Flagstaff and eventually bought a lot and built a home. Another thing Jean did was create exhibits for the South Rim. This particular one um, had to be housed in climate storage because of the tempera paints that would crack in the cold weather. As I mentioned, her grandfather was Eugene Peel. You might have heard of this poem more than, um, than the author, but what Jean 
did for her grandfather, I suppose, was create these wooden displays in that picture there of the characters in the poem. Somehow I I knew of, and, oh, and then she donated them to the Flagstaff Public Library for the kids' room, the children's part of the library. Somehow I knew of these panels, and I worked with the public library, and we got them, got these panels sent to the Eugene Field Museum in St. Louis. Otherwise, they would just be rotting away somewhere. Catherine on the left and Jean on the right in her home. I'll talk a little bit about Catherine. Born in 1907, she earned her master's degree in physical anthropology in 1929 from the University of Denver. She had met the Coltons uh, in maybe in 29, maybe 28 at some Southwestern Archaeological Co Conference. Her major professor uh, introduced her to the Coltons. They met again the following year, and at the, that time, the Coltons offered Catherine a summer job in a room in their home. Her summer job was to help coordinate the first Hopi Craftsman exhibition in 1930. Um, she stayed here the next 50 some years. She was the MA archaeology curator and also the librarian in her, in her second career. She died in 2001, and I got her elected to the Arizona Women's Hall of Fame in 2008. Wonderful woman, uh, a bit reticent as far as sharing MA history, but she was really important to me in my work here. Back to Jean, loved aerial photography, plus the thrill of flying. So we have a lot of aerial photographs from her. Here's the dam site and a little bit of page from 50 something. She also made exquisite maps of the area and she doted, you can see the numbers along the river channel there, those are sites. <coughs> Both Jean and Catherine kept journals of their trips on the river. Like Kim said, we think she took, Jean took 12 trips for over five years down the river. Catherine went on three of those, we think. Jean spent a whole lot of time creating this manuscript about Glen Canyon. Unfortunately, it's never been published. She loved petroglyphs, as most artists do, and she took stunning pictures that captured the serenity of Glen Canyon. However, all was not good. She wasn't a trained archeologist, so the professional archeologists scoffed at her work, her methods, and her even doing the work she was doing but she kept it up, she kept going, she didn't mind. She knew it was the right, she was doing the right thing. Back to the petroglyphs, pecked image using a human hand for scale. Oh, Kim, jump in. This is a, a pictograph that Jane drew um, from one of the sites. And she, I'm not quite sure why I thought it was um, an image of a um, bighorn sheep swimming. I, I, I'm not an artist, I don't see it, but um, when, as an archaeologist, when I see that, I think Awanyu, and some of you may be familiar. Awanyu is a, um, a, a deity, a Tetewa deity, so the Tewa linguistic group that um, occurs in the Rio, Rio Grande River Valley. Um, it's the pueblos of Santa Clara, San Ildefonso, Okeowinge, Tesuki, and Pawaki. Um, and their, and so their traditions, um, and Awanyu is the guardian of water. And it's a petroglyph that's found very commonly near springs, um, pools, and things like that. And it also occurs in, um, as a motif on prehistoric and historic pottery designs. And there's, if you're familiar with Mesoamerican archeology, span um, Quetzalcoatl, is a very similar plumed serpent, and Quetzalcoatl, um, which is a Nahuatl word, 
occurs in, between AD about 400 and 900, and the earliest um, images of Awanyu are about AD 1000. And so it's often thought, it's often cited as a potential connection, cultural connection between Northern Mesoamerica and the Southwest. Okay, uh, anyone who has seen the waterfalls fall, spilling over the canyon wall know how special that is. And here's a wonderful photograph from Jean that shows the boats they had and those clouds and just a stunning photo. And here is something that Catherine wrote on October 18th. <coughs> the sky was perfectly clear when we went to bed, but it rained a little about dawn and was cloudy and rainy most of the morning. As this was day for mail drop, we were in a conspicuous place. We hoped rain would clear. About 10.30 it did, and we put letters in ribbon on terrace above. Quote, carton luckies next week. For cigarettes? <laughs> and then an arrow pointing to the ledge below. A plane came over about 4.30. It went over us, circled, and went back down river. After a period, it returned and dropped a package which said, We'll bring Lucky's next week. <laughs> so they worked hard, but they also had fun. It's the way it should be. Here is Jean. No, no helmet, no ropes, no nothing. Going up those uh, hex steps. I was shy when Kim and I were working on this. She said, what about being 40 and climbing like that? That's no big deal. And more of those steps with some of her crew members. And these stunning, the way she composed the photographs is just amazing. She gathered surface evidence at sites. And Kim mentioned earlier that she did turn this over to the MA archaeology department and also two ceramic pots. Kim, didn't you say they're from a hidden alcove way up high? This particular fortified alcove had gourds in it. And you can sort of see a person sitting there on the right-hand side. I mentioned Jean had a rough time expecting, accepting being ignored. And after her river trips were over, she was advised by Catherine and her doctor to write a journal expressing her emotions, to get these, this angst and this disappointment out of her body so she could let go. I read it in tears and this particular sentence just jumped out at me that she did the work but didn't get any credit for it and all of these young grad students and people came in to work for Glen Canyon Project and she had to turn over all of her information for them to go on and do the excavation. That would break anybody's heart. Back to um, Catherine in a granary, and I have a note from Jean about Lake Canyon, April 17th. Stop to camp about mid-afternoon in Lake Canyon. It is a wonderful stopping place for photographers, archaeologists, botanists, anyone. Bill and Hugh went up the trail over the falls and upstream to the beautiful little ruin for photos and practice with a barometer and contour map. We three girls, that, I'll mention that in a minute, enjoyed the clear creek water and sunny weather for baths and laundry. We put our beds under the ledge behind the walls of a ruin at the mouth of the canyon. It was very cloudy and windy all night. Oh, hole in the rock. Amazing story. LDS pioneers from central and northern Utah built this staircase in the Navajo sandstone that the people on the left are standing on to carry their wagons and push their livestock down this staircase to settle southeastern Utah. Amazing story. Jean had motored by this several times before she actually took the three hours to stop and walk to the top and the view and then back to the boats. Okay, the three girls that she re Jean referenced 
were Jean, Catherine, and Zerfa Gaines. Zerfa Gaines was a 66-year-old botanist from Washington State. How they met, I'm guessing, was that her, Zerfa's son, Ed Gaines, was a Forest Service research scientist in charge of the uh, re Forest Service research going on here at the time, both at Fort Valley and later at NAU. I have no other way of knowing how those Jean and Captain Zerfa met up. Uh, she, if you go to Zerfa Gaines, collection at Washington State University. She does have a file about her work in Glen Canyon. Another stunning photograph. Now, I mentioned earlier that we had 120, we had money for 125 digitization to color correct most of these images. This is one that was color corrected. It looks kind of drab compared to the other ones in some ways, but it's still lovely. But this was not color corrected. The red started to bleed. Now the, well, in the last 20 years or so, m and archivists have digitized the entire collection. So, and it's put away in, in good storage, good archival storage. Yep. They will probably still continue to de deteriorate, but we at least have this. Beautiful secret passages. You can see the boats in the corner there. And then I just explained why it's looking so red. Can you find a person? And another aerial about the dam. We're kind of working down river here. Now we're at Antelope Canyon, Sentinel Rock, which is underwater. And they always took out at Lee's Ferry. And this is such a wonderful photo of Lee's Ferry looking down the screen. I had to include it. So in her journal, this is what Jean wrote. It never got easier for her. She, in fact, tried to commit suicide. And she died very young, well, six, early 60s. Okay, back to. Him. So, there's been a bunch of people who have worked at m &A over the last 20 years, various archivists, um, Susan, various people who have worked with the archives and collections who have realized, you know, how, how much um, Jean Foster contributed. And from the archaeology division perspective, her name crops up a lot. We see it on site cards, we see it on photos, there's references in various reports. But as Susan said, she never got the credit that she deserved. And it was largely, um, it was a factor of the times and it was a factor of the personalities at m and at the time. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, it was very uncommon to have women uh, in the, doing field work and in fact, Neither MNA nor University of Utah during the Glen Canyon Project had any women doing field work. They were all working in the lab exclusively, um, except for one one person in 1962, very late in MNAs. Um, there was a woman who, Marianne Stein, who had NSF funding to do work for a dissertation, and she led her own excavation project up near Navajo Mountain. But um, that was largely because she had the funding and she controlled what they were going to do. But from the, the funding that was available for the main part of Glen Canyon Project, uh, like I say, was there were never any women in the field. Um, as Susan alluded, the University of Utah primarily used graduate students for their field crews. MNA had professional archaeologists, um, but it was a very small crew and it was um, it, uh, there was one person whose wife was often involved, and that didn't actually go over very well with the rest of the crew. So it was a very different time um, from what it is now. The archaeology division, as we are currently, we're a staff of 10, and we're actually about two-thirds women. 
So times have changed. Sadly, they did not change in time for um, Jean to, to get recognition. Once she uh, wrote up the documentation she had done, um, it's all in the MA site files, archives, and in her, in the archive under, under the archaeological division and also under hers. Um, and that information got incorporated into some of MA's later work, but without explicit acknowledgement of Jean's contribution, which was, was huge. So I want to sort of circle back um, between 2014 and 2021, the Museum of Northern Arizona collaborated with the Glen Canyon National, Recre <coughs> National Recreation Area to go back and do condition assessments at sites that had been previously recorded. And this included a lot of sites from the Glen Canyon Project. It also included sites that had been recorded in the 70s and 80s during compliance surveys for things like the marinas, um, infrastructure as the lake filled and the, the recreation area was developed. Ultimately, over that time period, we, went, we revisited 491 sites, uh, including a number of them that had been recorded by, um, by Jean. I want to highlight a little bit about why she was so good. As Susan said, she had no uh, training as a professional archaeologist. When she worked with Catherine, Catherine imparted some of her knowledge um, but I think Susan, uh, Susan, I think Jean had an intrinsic understanding of what was necessary and the fact that she would collect these artifacts from the surface of the sites and take photos of them. Those photos are still in the collections and the purpose was to be sent back to m a so that the trained archaeologists could look at those and could interpret the, the sites where Jean felt that she might not be able to. Um, but one thing Jean did, and you can see it here, she took all of her photos, almost all of her photos at archaeological sites in both black and white and color. And that's something that archaeologists were just starting to do at the time and did up until digital photography really took over um, as a medium. And so, I mean, in my early career, I can remember lugging around two cameras in every photo that you took, black and white and a color. Uh, this is Shock Trail, which was built um, in, by the early LDS ranchers in the area to bring livestock down so that they could be wintered down along the river. And they actually cut these steps in the steep sections up near the top, and then there's a bench, and then down in the last section to get down to the river. Jean's photos, this is what it looks like now. This, this is looking at it sideways, but you can see the big cut that they made to, and all these the steps that you're looking at face on here are along this cut. It's hard from the lake to get a view looking straight at it. One of the sites that Jean documented in um, 1957 that we went back to is called Story Ledge. Um, wasn't her name for it, it's been named since. But this is another example, um, Jean's black and white and color photos and our recreation. When we go back and we do condition assessment at these sites, one of the things we do is try and repeat the photography that we have from, from the original recording and from other people who might have come and monitored it later. And what we're doing is trying to look at impacts from Na uh, natural erosion, from visitation, from inundation. You can see this is the masonry structure. It shows up really nicely in her photo here, not quite as well here, um, but that's a masonry room. Um, you can also see from ours, you can see that it's been inundated because this is the calcium carbonate deposit that the lake leaves, the bathtub ring, and so you can see that this was the upper level of the lake at one time. It's now receded. Um, obviously, um, but but you know clearly it's not there on hers. Um, this these big slabs of rock here have fallen since the lake went back down. You're seeing the backside of them that don't have the calcium carbonate. The underside that's laying on the down here does have it. So those have spalled off since the lake was up high and then receded. Now the sandstone is very porous and being inundated tends to. Um, cause it to collapse like that, which is, is going to be an impact to sites in the future. So th these are the sorts of things. You can also see um, here these petroglyphs right here that are just peeking in in her photo. They're covered with the um, calcium carbonate right here, but I'm going to come back to those. 
So this is a close-up of that structure. And you can see, obviously, genes and hours. You can see that the back wall actually weathered its inundation pretty well. It's still in pretty good shape. The front wall has collapsed. And that's one thing we found when we went back to these sites is that the masonry is just built with um, local clay and sand mortar. And so when it's inundated by water, that mortar dissolves and then the walls tend to just collapse. Usually they, they do this, they just collapse down in place. You can still see that they're there. Um, you can still make out the outline, but they're not standing. The, the impact of inundation to sites is largely controlled by where the site sits and how and the, the topography of the canyon. In, back in tributary canyons that are narrow and tight, when the lake, when it was a lake and people were out there on boats, in tight canyons or real sinuous canyons, the boats have to go very slow and so they're not making a lot of wake. Um, and so although the mortar dissolves and the walls collapse, they tend to stay in place like this. And you can see how narrow this canyon is. In fact, you can see, it's a little hard to see here, I should have lightened it up. There's a lake right there. <laughs> this, this, the lake had dropped, but there was still water in this canyon here. Obviously in hers, there's not. And that contrasts in big open bays um, where the boats can go zipping along. The wake tends to move all of that, the masonry that has slumped down. And so we went to some alcoves where it's been totally washed out. You can see that in the exhibit um, in the gallery there. But this one was actually in reasonably good shape. This is the, the petroglyphs that were at that site. And so that first photo was just caught the edge of these. Here's a person for scale. We could not duplicate this photo because there's now a bunch of vegetation growing right in front. So we couldn't take the straight on photo. Um, so we did this sideways photo, but you can still see all the elements, the, the two um, mountain sheep and then the... And what we found is that in areas where the lake has been out for a long period of time now, this calcium carbonate layer is starting to flake off and the petroglyphs are still preserved. So you can still see them. We're concerned long term because, like I said, the Navajo sandstone is very soft. And so we're concerned that the, the petroglyphs will be subject to increased erosion through wind. Um, so we have proposed to the Park Service that they go in and try and do some more detailed um, documentation of them before that happens. One of the things that we did, um, which was both fun and really frustrating at, at times, was trying to identify the location of sites that were still inundated. Mm -hmm. So this is Jean's photo, and you can see these two little, that those are two little masonry rooms in a very shallow alcove on the wall. And we had a plot on a map, so we could go back to where we thought it was. But then the, the thing is trying to decide whether you're in the right place when it's not out. But you can see here, the surface topography matches. There's a little bit of an overhang here. There's this little alcove right there. There's this bigger alcove, which now is covered with, with calcium carbonate, but wasn't. Um, rough surface here, rough surface here. We couldn't get exactly the same angle, but it's pretty close. And so we were convinced that this little overhang right here is the top of this, and that those two masonry structures are down here. <laughs> about so on our on our form that we fill out for the park service, we had the boat we were on had a had a depth finder, so we would float over and say they're about 60 feet submerged at this point. Uh, we did have a number of sites like that, but the fact that Jean took these really quality photos and almost every site, she took an overview photo and then she took photos in the site itself, allowed us to go back and do this and verify that, that the site location map they have is right. If the water continues to drop, in fact, this was in 2019, those may be exposed by now. I don't know, I haven't been back up in that canyon yet. And I mean, I'm sure everybody's heard, you know, about the receding lake levels um, as, as the water continues to recede, I think that the climate models now are telling us that Lake Powell will never reach full pool again. And if it continues to go down, we're anticipating that more sites will be exposed. So MA is trying to work with Park Service to document those 
um, and go, get the word out to people who are visiting that you know they need to be careful because these sites are really fragile. Um, so I wanted to sort of end on that. But really, this this lecture is about Jean Foster and the work that she did informed the work that the MA professional archaeologists went back and did between 1957 and 1963 and informed our work when we went back. And it's really a tribute to her that she persevered. Um, as Susan said, there is a uh, manuscript that talks about, that has those amazing hand-drawn maps of where she found the sites. It has a lot of hand drawings of the um, petroglyphs because as most of you who, who studied, you know, you've been to a lot of rock art sites know, a photograph can be really useful for looking at rock art, but depending on the light and the time of day, the season of the year, a lot of times it, a photo doesn't bring out all the elements. And so having an artist who's able to do those hand drawings is really invaluable for the archaeological record. Um, I personally admire those people greatly because my artistic skill is about the same as the Awanya. <laughs> so I think Susan and I um, are happy to answer any questions that you have. So about that drawing of the Awanya, uh -huh. what's the size of that? Oh, there was a scale. It was a scale. Yeah. yeah. And uh, sometimes the, the Awanyus are really detailed and really do have a, a long serpent body. And they really do very much look like a snake. Sometimes they're much more stylized than you. And sometimes there's two horns. They can be either one horn or two horns. So you mentioned the manuscript was, of Glen Canyon was not published. But has MA made it available in any kind of digital format for other people to? Just to read? I don't think so. No. Is that something that the museum would consider doing? Yeah. Depending on good. depending on archaeologists. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly that's a good idea. Um, the one the the one um, issue with that may be that she has site locations, and so as many of you know, um, site the location of archaeological sites are protected under the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. Um, and in, in fact, they're one of the few pieces of information that are um, not subject to FOIA. And it's because when Congress passed that act, they recognized that um, there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, who don't treat archaeological sites as they should. So it's uh, that's a great idea. It would take probably going through and redacting some of that information, but that certainly would be possible. So tying together the site location uh, issue to the climate issue, uh, the discussions about the future of Lake Powell include some very specific discussions of elevation levels at Power Pool and right above the uh, bypass tunnels. Right. I'm wondering if anyone has done an analysis to see at those levels how many sites would be exposed. So you, know, you were speculating about how much the lake might have dropped in two years since that one image was taken. We can look at elevations and then go after those sites. Right. And that might be a, a, a project to prioritize protection as well. Right. And the Park Service is fully aware of these issues. Um, of course, it always comes down to money. Um, and the work that we did between 2014 and, 20, and 2000, uh, 2021 was funded by the Park Service. I know they have submitted proposals for additional monitoring to go out and look at the things that land that's been exposed since 2021. I don't know what the status of that funding is, but certainly m and would be happy to do that. Although I will tell you, walking around in previously inundated areas is not the most fun thing. <laughs> but you do find some interesting stuff that got tossed off of um, houseboats. Uh, I've had a ton of broken lawn chairs. Does it have her camera? Her camera. She had at least three. Uh, she had a black and white um, 35 millimeter and her Hasselblad camera was the one that took these, most of the images that are in this presentation. Hasselblad has two, two inch by two inch slides, which is a lot bigger than a 35 millimeter. And that's probably why we get the detail that uh, from the Hasselblad. I forgot to mention that 
the Hasselblad photos, the 500 photos of Jean's collection were left with Catherine after Jean passed and Catherine donated them to the museum. Otherwise, we would not even have this record of this, of the, the beautiful images from the Hasselblad. So just for my information, you said archaeologists and Jean also took black and white and color photographs of every site. And could you explain the, the the technical reason for doing that? There's two reasons. Uh, there's two reasons. One actually is showcased very well here. Black and white um, film is archivally stable, and it's it still needs um, it still needs care, and it needs to be stored correctly. But even when it's not stored in ideal conditions, and Tony might be able to speak to this more, um, black and white film is much more stable. And so it's considered our long-term archival record. And the color photographs are typically taken because that's how we see things. And so, for, especially for like public illustrations, um, black and our color is considered more um, user-friendly. Also, some of the things you see come out differently in black and white and color. And you saw that very well on the one side of <coughs> Monastery Ledge. In the color, you could really see that masonry room. And in the black and white, you had to kind of know what you were looking for. So it's, it's both of those reasons. The latest issue of Arizona Highways has a nice example of that, where they, they're showing uh, reproductions of photographs of resorts in Arizona. Uh, in, in film that is also degraded in a similar fashion, but then they also spend some time restoring the images. And so with time and obviously money, those images can be restored to look like they were what they originally taken. Mm -hmm. Right, interesting. Right. Yeah, and we would love to get funding to do the color stabilization for the rest of Jean's um, collection. It's something that like uh, Susan said, 150 of the of the approximately 100, 500 have been done, and that's the big two by two um, Hasselblad, Hasselblad um, negatives. I have a question about Catherine Bartlett's time as an archaeologist. Was she doing mostly lab work, and when she was affiliated with MA, or was yes. she allowed to go out? Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The question is, what did Catherine do as curator of archaeology? Was she in the lab most of the time, or did she, could she go to the field work too? Being uh, very close to the Coltons as she was, she could go to the field, mainly as a bystander, maybe doing some little field work, but certainly not doing... I mean, she was a physical anthropologist. She knew bones so she could recognize things like that. So, but she was also doing a lot in the collections. And when she started, there were not standardized guidelines on how to manage museum collections. She developed them, especially for the Southwest. Pretty impressive. Tony, I think, has a comment. No, on I actually have a question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, you talked about the photos here about Ken, thanks. Uh, but my question was about uh, how Jean funded her research? Her own the, pocket. Uh, was it out of her own pocket? Was she ever an M&A employee or never? No. Okay. In, in 1957, um, when M&A and University of Utah got the first little snippets of money sort of to do their pre-planning for field work, uh, M&A did pay for one of she her She had a small session. She had a small, and I think basically they paid for food mm -hmm. and transportation. Uh, they never paid uh, Jean right. in any way. She, she was never formally affiliated with the museum. Okay. Did she go with Pat Nichols or did Pat Nichols go on any of those trips in those 50s? They, they would run into each other on the river. <laughs> The, did you hear the question about Tad Nichols, who was also a, a Glen Canyon photographer? Uh, his collection is at NAU now, Special Collections. Uh, somebody. It, it was quite busy on the river. The pictures all look like they were the only ones there, but there were miners and other 
tourist trips and you name it, people out on the river then. Yeah, that's that's kind of one of the funny things because I think both Susan and I have run into this as you as you do research and delve into uh, the mytho, mythos of Glen Canyon. I mean, not certainly it's, it was a huge loss from an environmental and from a um, scenic, but some of the environmental groups, particularly the Sierra Club, who came afterwards and lamented the loss of it, um, made it sound like. Well, the, the title of Elliot Porter's book, the, the place that no one knew. Mm -hmm. And I have to be cynical and say, well, it's the place that the Sierra Club didn't know. <laughs> the, the, if you read the journals of Susan, or of, of Jean and Catherine and all of the archaeologists, they talk about daily running into the cowboys down there who were running cows in the, in the canyons, the uranium prospectors who were down there, it was the 1950s. Um, the river runners, because the river had really become the place to go when people found out that it wasn't going to be a river anymore. And so daily, all of these crews who were working down there document running into all of these people um, down there. So it was certainly it was certainly a huge loss, but it certainly wasn't unknown to the population of the Southwest. We should also probably mention the generations of the people Mm. Yeah, well. and in that fact, that's well. and my comment about about recording the, the historic sites down there for both Utah and uh, M and A, there were a lot of Navajo and Paiute families who were still living down, particularly along the San Juan River, but also um, in at the mouth tributary of a lot of these canyons, Cummings Mesa, where M and A archaeologists worked on the uplands. Um, still had a lot of Navajo livestock and a number of the prehistoric sites they documented were along trails that were still in use by the Navajo and Paiute people who would bring their cattle down and winter along the river. So yeah, there were a lot of um, uh, indigenous people who were still living there and could tell stories about some of these sites that the archaeologists were, were documenting, some of the old Navajo homes. Um, so, just a couple of things. First of all, thank you very much. This was our awesome presentation. Um, we actually knew Miss Foster. We were some of the children who worked for her. Yes! Wow. <laughs> yes! And I would love nothing more than, than to get in the archives because I understand there's like time cards and stuff from, from <laughs> those days. And there, there are, there's, an entire, there's an entire, probably a foot of shelf space of her bird journals. Okay, oh, so, so we, we have archaeology and, and we have birds. Yeah. Um, talk, our hand right talk, in there. talk to this um, man over here. Who's that person? <laughs> that is Tony Thibodeau, who oh, is. All right. So, um, and I, I, can, I can confirm what you shared here today. I mean, at the end of her life, we knew her. And she was, she definitely talked all the time about how she documented the, these archaeological sites in the Glen Canyon down on her own dime and hanging out of an airplane. And she was just such a renaissance woman and such a daredevil. And it's really heartwarming to see that you guys have finally given her her due. Thank many, you. many years probably passed you, but it's really fantastic. My question is, do you know when her and Ms. Bartlett started working with Russ Bald at the University on the Pinion J study? When did that start to come into the picture? Peter? I don't know. That, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that information is in the is in her archives um, because it would be documented in her. In addition to her archaeological um, records, we have, like I say, all of her bird journals. We have a lot of correspondence. Um, you guys are probably mentioned in there. Because we probably started working for her like in '77, thereabouts, '78-ish, and at that point they were already because. It was a multi generational study. They were already probably two layers, almost in some cases three layers deep, in the genealogical tracing of the, the birds. And anyways, I would love to get into the archives if it's possible. Yes, we would love you to, and we would love to actually have you write up some reminiscences. No, 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 no. Totally do it. That would be that would be fantastic to get your your reminiscences of working with Jean. And add that to the archives. Yeah. That would be all the distance because she was just Yes, that'd be <laughs> well, you know, the archives are art for, for history and for
gratuities. So, um, yeah, come talk to us afterwards. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Was there any evidence of Everett Bruce found in any of the surveys down there? So. Those of you who are familiar with Everett Roos and the story of Everett Roos, he was an um, artist, writer, adventurer who went missing in 1957? Or, or earlier. Right? Is that right? It, it, it may have been early 50s. So what is this amazing story to us now was recent history when people were in that, in, were down in there. Um, I know the University of U Utah crews had it in their mind and were looking because they were primarily on that west side of the river. Um, but as far as I know, and I'm not as familiar with the archives for the University of Utah's Glen Canyon project, but as far as I know, there's no record in there um, of them finding it. Now, there is a petroglyph um, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he was one of the members of the search party for Everett Roos, and it's, there's a glyph, and I want to say that's dated 59, and it's in a tributary canyon to Escalani. Um, it's actually one that we went and monitored. Um, it was still above, it's still above um, water level. But I, I don't think that they found anything else. Good question, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did I wonder if everybody heard that? Yeah, did people hear that? The question was, did the archaeologists or Jean or anybody who was working down there find any evidence of Everett Roos who had gone missing in the, uh, within a decade before that? Peter? In the 1950s, Catherine Bartlett and Jean Foster recorded a number of sites of the Red Rock Sedona area. And I was wondering if you came from and mentioned if this was just casual work that they were doing or whether they had any kind of a concerted effort to document sites of the Sedona area. I don't. I'm no. not familiar with the, no. the site documentation at all, but it would look be that. in the records. Okay. Yeah. What do you know when they moved here in '53? I don't remember the exact dates. I think it'd be something between '52 and '57. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it might have been after they were moved up here, but maybe we're going down there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming.